Well, morning, everyone. As Chris has said, my name is Peter. I'm one of the leaders here, but we're remembering that uh, Dave and Becca are away. Um, Dave's only away this weekend, actually. Um, Becca's gone up to Leeds, so he's without the children, really. I'm not sure how gleeful that is for him, but uh, clearly that's the way they've worked it. For the last quite considerable time, we've been looking at John's Gospel, and I want you to turn to that if you have a Bible with you, page 1083, if you've got a church Bible, it's John 15, and um, we uh, have been looking really at, at, at John, and particularly these chapters 13 through to chapter 17, which are some of the deepest and most helpful and most challenging of chapters, I think you'll agree with me. Um, If you're in my home group, you'll know that it's stretched our minds quite a bit to read John and to try and analyze and apply what we've read. It stretches our mind, doesn't it, John's gospel? You can't read it without your, your brain beginning to ache a bit. But I hope that as we've gone through John, Um, and particularly as we've gone through these precious chapters, 13 through in the end to chapter 17, that it's not just stretched our mind, but it's warmed our hearts. That is the important thing, that not just do we think right, but do we feel right? Do we have our hearts warmed to what we are reading? What's interesting, and I just want to go back a few verses from where actually we're going to be concentrating this morning, chapter 15, verse 18 onwards. I want us to just look at verse 9 uh, to verse 17 and just remind ourselves in those remarkable verses, we basically have encapsulated what it is to be a Christian. That's as simple as what we see, as hard as the words might seem to us. For instance, verse 9, as the Father, says Jesus, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. And there we have the criteria of the love of the Lord Jesus. The Father loves Jesus, his Son, from eternity, superbly, infinitely. And then Jesus says, well, The love that I have with the Father from eternity is the love I have for you, my disciples. And that love, says Jesus, has taken him to the cross for his disciples. Do you look at just verse 13? Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. So the love which Jesus has for us, the love that God has for the Son and for his children, is the love that took Jesus to the awful cross of Calvary. And there his blood was shed that our sins might be forgiven. But do you notice how that is put? In in verse 14, you, he says to his disciples, are my friends if you do what I command. In other words, The Lord Jesus says to us, though he is King Jesus this morning and in control of this cosmos, he says, those who love me, those who are my children, my disciples, actually are my friends. That our Jesus Christ this morning is the friends of people like us as we trust and obey him. And then, if we are his friends, he draws us into this community of love. And uh, he says there, um, in verse 12, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. There's the challenge. In other words, what is he saying? He's saying, well, if we are Christians, we aren't isolated people just stuck out there on our own. We're people who are part of a community. And that community for us is this church. And that church should be characterized by love. A love which is self-sacrificing like the Lord Jesus. A love that puts other people first before ourselves. A love that makes us servants of one another. Just as our Lord Jesus, as we've seen uh, in chapter 13, came to serve us. And actually wash the filthy feet of his disciples. And we must have that same heart and that same attitude if we belong to Jesus. And there's the question. I just want to raise that before we actually go into our passage. And say, 
when we think of Jesus as our friend, when we think of him as the one who sacrificed himself on the cross, when we think of Jesus as the one who calls us his friends, when we think of Jesus as the one who's called us into a fellowship with one another, a community of love, is that true for you? That's the challenge, isn't it? Does that describe you? Does that describe the way you see yourself this morning? And if not, maybe as we go through this morning, you can think about that and think, how does this fit with me? Whether that is the way I see Jesus and the way he sees me. Um, I want to talk, first of all, about two worlds. Um, I saw a quote, you may know it. It comes from George Bernard Shaw, who had a sharpish wit most of the time. And he wrote this, the longer I live, the more inclined to the belief that this earth is used by other planets as a lunatic asylum. <laughs> he certainly knew how to use words well, didn't he? But we sort of agree with it, don't we? As we look out on our world even this morning and read the news and our newspapers and so on, we just feel that maybe this world has gone completely mad. And... Uh, it was in George Bernard Shaw day, and it surely is in our own. Interestingly, as we open up this passage at verse 18, we are actually confronted with two worlds in a way. Verse 18, if the world hates you, says Jesus to his disciples, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Jesus is speaking to his disciples in the upper room and he's basically saying that for us here this morning, we go about our normal lives. You will get up in the morning, you'll have your breakfast, you'll go out, and you'll go to work or you'll deal with the children all day or whatever it is. It's just the normal life that we have. But if you're a believing person in Jesus, if you are a disciple truly of the Lord Jesus, he says that it is as though you're in a different world. Yeah, you're going through the ordinary, the mundane. Of course you are. We live on this world. But he says it's actually as though you're not in this world. Because I, says Jesus, have taken you out of the world. You no longer belong to this world. That for the Christian, it doesn't matter how long you live or what your job is or what you do in this world. At the end of the day, this world will never feel ultimately like home. That's what Jesus says about us if we truly belong to him. But then that's that world, the world, as it were, of the disciples, of those who love Jesus. But then he goes on about another world. And, and here it is. He says, they, the, this other world, will treat you this way, that is persecution, which we'll talk about, because of my name. For they do not know the one who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father as well. If I had not done among them the works no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. As it is, they have seen, and yet they have hated both me and my father. But this is to fulfill what is written in their law. They hated me without reason. So Jesus now, having looked at his disciples and said, well, look, you're in this world, but it's not going to feel like home. He now looks at a world where people feel very much at home. And what is it that we read about in those verses? Well, we read that people are willfully ignorant of the things of God. It is as simple as that. That they do not want to know the truth about God and about his saviour, Jesus Christ. He is writing, of course, at a time when he had been ministering amongst people like us for three years plus, And basically they had seen everything he had done and heard everything he'd said, but they didn't believe it. Uh, they just did not see in Jesus anything 
particularly that attracted them to him. They were willfully ignorant of Christ. And he's saying that that's what it's like for many of us. We are willfully ignorant of the things of God. We have uh, the scriptures in front of us. Of course, we can't see Jesus, but we can read about him and it's in great deal and precision, but we don't want to know. In fact, I'm astonished sometimes listening to some very, very intelligent people, sometimes on the television or wherever, and they're talking about the Bible and about Christianity, and I just think, well, they're stupid. That isn't what the Bible says. That's not what it's about. They may be brilliant, but they're ignorant. They're ignorant of the things that matter. And that's what he says here. Not only are people ignorant, says Jesus, but they actually um, don't care about sin. They have their own view of what sin is. They're either indifferent to sin or, and we see it today, they glory in it. It is what is expected. And so that's the way they live. And they do not, as it were, worship God as they should. This can apply, of course, as it did to Jesus' day, to religious people. People who may go to church, people who may read their Bible, may call themselves Christians and so on, just as the Jewish people around Jesus thought they were the most religious and accepted by God uh, people on earth. Jesus says, no, no. You and I can give 2% to God on a Sunday and 98% of the time live as though there is no God. That's what we can be like. So by come Monday, it's as though there is no God. And we go about our own way and do our own thing. Now, we can be very nice with each other and talk about, you know, I'm a bit agnostic or, I, I, you know, I believe in God, but he's up there. It's a God that, you know, suits me and so on. What is so interesting about Jesus is the harsh words that he uses. If <laughs> you notice that, he says, they have seen and yet they have hated both me and my father. Whoever hates me, says Jesus in verse 23, hates my father as well. So he doesn't mince his words. He says, for those of us who will not accept Christ as Savior and worship him, we hate him. At the root of our being, if you strip everything away, at heart, we hate him. He is King Jesus, but we don't want him king over us. We hate him. And Jesus says, it doesn't matter what your religion is. If you don't love me, you don't love the Father. Or to put it negatively, if you hate me, you hate the Father as well. Now, when King Charles was crowned, there were those who protested. Do you remember? And in fact, while he's been in New Zealand, there's been one or two moments of fiasco where people have said, basically, you're not my king. And they have protested because they're Republicans at heart. And they've said about Charles, you may be crowned as king, but you're not my king. And that is fundamentally what Jesus is talking about. To be a Christian is someone who accepts Jesus Christ as king. He is my king and I obey him and I love him and I serve him. That is what Jesus is saying. And so the question to us uh, and to everyone who reads the scriptures and in Jesus' day who heard him is, is he our king? Or are we still living our lives according to ourselves, according to our own ideas? according to our own lifestyle, according to our own ideas of God. No, says Jesus, you either love me or you hate me. And if you hate me, you hate the Father. He is King Jesus. And so the question I suppose Jesus is inadvertently asking here is which world do we belong to? Do we belong to the world that loves Jesus and therefore will never feel quite at home here? There will always be as though we're working across the grain, as it were. Or do we live in this world where we're oblivious to Christ? Don't really care. Who live as though we are the king, not Christ. That's the world that in the end is all around us. So we are asked, which world do we belong to? But then we come to a solemn reality. Now, we're all plagued by adverts, 
I, I don't know if you still have a landline. Some of you have given up your landline because it's such a nuisance. But you're getting continual calls, aren't you, by somebody who basically wants to change your life by lagging your loft or something. You know, and, uh, and, oh, and then you have it on the television as well. You know, if, if you buy this product, my word, your life is going to be wonderful. Um, or if, if you have this holiday, oh, it'll be just like heaven. You'll never forget it, this holiday. Or you'll have the house in the country. That's the thing. You get the house in the country uh, with its five acres. The fact that one day you're going to have arthritis and you can't actually mow the lawn is not going to be significant. You're going to have the house. It's going to be wonderful. And your life is just going to be changed. That is advertising, isn't it? That's what people earn an absolute fortune out of and spend a fortune on doing it. When you look at advertising like that, you begin to think that Jesus was probably the worst salesman the earth has ever seen. Why? Well, listen to how he speaks. Verse 17, which is the passage we looked at last week, Jesus says, this is my command, love each other. Well, isn't that wonderful? I mean, well, let's just stop there. It's, it's so tender, isn't it? It's cuddly. Let's love each other. And I can promise you there will be churches this morning we'll never get past that point. Let's just love each other. That's what we need. And we feel really cuddly about that. But the next verse, which is typical of the Lord Jesus and typical of the way that John writes, you suddenly feel the gears crash. Why? If the world hates you, says Jesus to his disciples, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to this world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. So he says to his disciples who want to follow the Lord Jesus, just think that as you live in this world, the world in the end, the world that does not want God, is going to hate you for it. They're not going to be neutral. They're going to hate you. Why? Well, Jesus tells us uh, that uh, if you belong to the world, it would love you as its own, that he is the one who has been persecuted first. Remember what I told you, he says in verse 20, a servant, us, is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, says Jesus, they will persecute you also. If they obeyed my teaching, they will obey yours also. It's a simple thing. That if you and I are following in the footsteps of Jesus, then we will be persecuted just like he was. Listen, has there ever been a man who has walked this earth more wonderfully than him? Has there ever been a man seen walking this earth who was more loving, who was more kind, who was more compassionate, to the poor and the weak and the hurt and the sinful? Was there ever a man who showed such mercy but they hated him for it? And they pursued him to death, to the cross. That's where the hatred for Jesus took them. And Jesus said, well, if that's true of me, then of course it will be true of you. That is the world that we live in. And for 2,000 years, you don't need me to tell you, that has been the fact of the church and of Christians across the world. In fact, it's interesting, our granddaughters, both of them, uh, used to go to the school in Y, the secondary school in Y, which is a village just north of Ashford. I don't know, do you all know why? <laughs> why, I might ask. Anyway, it's a, it's a lovely village. And uh, we have spent our time as grandparents, you know, either taking them there or picking them up and bringing them back and all of that, normal grandparent duty. But as I've driven through, not the, the main village of Wye, but where the church is, I noticed that there was a, a plaque on the wall. Uh, I call it a plaque if you're in the south, or plaque if you come from Stoke-on-Trent like me. Anyway, this plaque is on the wall. And I think that's an odd thing to see. I just couldn't, I could never read it because I was going past it, you know. I couldn't see it. But here it is. Two men. John Philpot of Tenterden, interestingly, and 
Thomas Stevens of Biddenden, interestingly, were burnt at the stake in 1557. Why? Because they love Jesus. That's the reason. That was during the reign of Mary I, who was a fierce uh, Catholic, Roman Catholic, hated Protestants. And these two men somehow had obviously made it clear that they followed the Lord Jesus as a disciple and were burnt at the stake outside the church in Why? Did you know that? It's astonishing, isn't it? And one of them came from this very village. And so it has gone on. In 2023, it is reckoned there were something like 5,000 Christians who lost their lives for being Christians across the world. That is the world that we live in. If they persecuted Jesus, do not be surprised if people persecute you. The thing is, of course, we live in a fairly tolerant country, we think. But in my lifetime, we have moved from where Christianity was expected and accepted by most people, even my mum and dad, who, as, I, as you know, never allowed religion to be talked about in at home, ever, on pain of death. They would not talk about religion. But they, if you'd have asked them, they said, of course we're Christians. That's what was expected. And we've moved from that to a sort of tolerance of Christians. Well, it's, it's a faith that, you know, we can put up with. But that is not the case now. The Christian faith today, the Christian teaching, is seen to be the enemy. And it is the enemy of society. We are now the bad guys. So let us be clear. And that's why Jesus was incredibly honest, wasn't he? Would you have sold your religion in the way Jesus did and said, well, if you're going to follow me, you're going you're to live a persecuted life. You wouldn't have done it. But Jesus wants to put it to us that if we really want to follow Jesus, if we really want to walk like he did, as it were, then we will not be tolerated. And sooner or later, we will hit a wall of either persecution or low-level dislike or ostracism. That is just the way it's going to be. And therefore, Jesus says to us this morning, reckon on it. Don't be surprised by it. In fact, uh, he, he's going to, to go on about this solemn reality. And um, the question we would ask, why on earth would we follow Jesus? He's saying, you're going to suffer if you follow me. Why would we want to? Well, he typically gives us an answer. Why? And it is a comforting reality. Here it is. It doesn't sound comforting, this, but stay with me. Verse six, uh, chapter 16, verse 1. All this I have told you so that you will not fall away. They will put you out of the synagogue. That basically means you will be a pariah in your society. You will be an utter outcast. That's what it meant to a Jewish Christian in those days and to some degree today. In fact, the time is coming when anyone who kills you will think they're offering a service to God. They will do such things because they have not known the Father or me. I have told you this so that when their time comes, you will remember that I have warned you about them. How on earth is that comforting? Because <laughs> he's just spelled out what persecution is going to mean, particularly for the disciples in the first century. That's exactly what they experienced. Why is that comforting? Well, it's comforting, I put it to you, because he knows. Jesus knows exactly what's going to happen. He is absolutely aware of what will happen to his disciples in this life. He is not going to be surprised. He's not going to be wrong-footed. He is not, as it were, going to be in heaven um, puzzled by what to do next because my disciples are being persecuted. None of that. Why? Because he knows. He knows every step that his disciples are going to take and the consequences. And here's the obvious conclusion from that is not only does Jesus know what is going to happen, but he is in control of it. He is sovereign over it. He will not allow anything to happen to his people, we read this throughout the Bible, without his permission. He is in absolute control of what happens to his believers' lives. 
Now, here's the thing, it seems to me, that every one of us who knows our Bibles this morning will be nodding to that. Of course, the Lord Jesus is sovereign. He said that. All power has been given to me. He's sovereign. But it's not enough to nod to the doctrine. Jesus is telling us and his disciples of the day that they need to know this so that they will not fall away. In other words, he is saying to us, look, like in a way I began this morning, it's not enough to have this in the head. We need it in the heart. We need to enfold these truths of the sovereignty of God in our lives and that he cares for us so much that nothing will happen to us without his permission and nothing will happen to us, nothing will happen to his people without ultimately it being to the glory of God. We need to get hold of that and embrace it in our hearts. Why? Because as Jesus says, when these things happen, when our life, maybe not persecution, but when our life goes wrong, and as it were, the wheels fall off, what are we going to be like as his believers? Are we going to be those that can enfold this doctrine in the worst and the darkest of times and say, Lord Jesus, I know you love me and you are my friend and none of this will ultimately destroy me, that you will hold me fast. And in it somewhere, somehow, there's going to be glory. That's the sort of heart we've got to enfold. That's the sort of heart that we've got to have for these truths. Not just that we believe them, tick, I believe in the sovereignty of God, but tick, I believe it when the worst comes. Because it will, won't it? For all of us, at some point. So there is the first thing. The second thing is an interesting one. Verse 26 of chapter 15. When the advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me and you also must testify for you have been with me from the beginning. And here we're introduced again to the Holy Spirit of God. Incidentally, next week, Dave is going to just deal with the great doctrine of the Holy Spirit. So we all look forward to that. But for now, let's just look briefly at where we are here. Jesus says that the advocate is going to come. The Holy Spirit is coming. In verse 7, he says this, but very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Remember where we are in the upper room here. The the disciples are in incredible distress. They are broken men. Why? Because the Jesus they've been with for three years plus, who they thought was going to be seen as king in Israel, is going to die. He's going to leave them. And they are bereft. They've left everything for Jesus. Now he's going to leave them. How on earth are they going to be helped? How is this going to be a good thing that he's going, that he's leaving them? Well, he tells them the good thing is because the Spirit of God is going to come. The Holy Spirit is going to come to them. And he says this, and as I say, we can only deal with this briefly. He will not speak on his own. Just look down to verse 13 on his own. He will speak only what he hears and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. There's a little phrase in there which is just so important. Anyone know what it is? If we understand the spirit of God, we've got to get that phrase. Do you know what it is? Well, you're not going to risk it, are you? (laughs) He will glorify me. There it is. Theologians sometimes talk about the Holy Spirit as the self-effacing third person of the Trinity. You know what being self-effacing is. You, you turn your gaze from yourself to someone else. And the Holy Spirit of God is, as it were, a torchlight. And the torchlight, where does it shine? To Jesus. He says Jesus, will glorify me. He doesn't come 
to glorify himself. Though he is God, the Holy Spirit, he doesn't come to glorify himself. He comes to glorify Jesus and to bring to you and I, ordinary Christians, and for us to be able to see and enfold the glory of Jesus, his love and his mercy and his compassion, and to know it in our hearts as well as our heads. That is the work of the Spirit, to work in us in that way but also to give us the power to live as disciples for Jesus. That's what he's talking about uh, when, in verse 8. When he comes, he will prove the world to be the, in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment, about sin because people do not believe in me, says Jesus, about righteousness because I am going to the Father where you can see me no longer, and about judgment because the prince of this world now stands condemned. But just to put that briefly, if we are living for Jesus Christ as we should and walking in his footsteps, then we will be that challenge to the world. Not because of us, but because of the power of the Spirit of God. He gives these people the power to live for Jesus and also to testify to Christ. That should encourage us, because most of us are terrified at doing that with our workmates and our home and even our families. But Jesus says the Spirit's job is to do that. He will do it. He will testify of me. He will challenge the world of sin and of failure and of godlessness. That's his job. And he'll do it through you, in your words and in your life. But I want to leave with just one other wonderful thing. The Holy Spirit will glorify me, says Jesus. Earlier on, Jesus has spoken to them. And he said, I'm not going to leave you as orphans. Because that's what they thought they were going to be now. Their Savior was leaving them. Their Lord. I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I'm going to come to you. How about that then? How does Jesus come to us? Well, the answer is, by the Spirit. The Spirit brings the living Christ who is in heaven. And as it were, to every Christian, wherever you and I are, he brings the living Jesus to come to us and to live with us. Do you remember how Jesus said, I will be in you? I haven't got my head around that. In fact, I looked up a commentary to try and get some grip on it, and the commentator, who I admire immensely, dodged it, <laughs> which gave me no help. Jesus comes to every one of us who trusts him. And doesn't live out there somewhere, but lives with us and in us. When you crawl out of bed tomorrow morning and you face the week, and for some the week might be pretty hard, for others it's just a boring, ordinary week, or it might be challenging, you're not facing it alone. Why? Because the Spirit of God dwells in every believer and because he brings the glory of Jesus and the presence of Jesus into the ordinary believer's life and heart. The last words Jesus spoke on earth was surely, I am with you to the end of the age. And we live with that every day. Jesus is with you to the end of the age.